couple of minutes. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Zia Isola. I am the director of the diversity office uh, of the Genomics Institute. And um, last was it June, we brought we had a panel on diversity at the UC Bioengineering Symposium here. One of our panelists was Victor Rogers. Uh, so this is sort of a continuation of that conversation, and he'll look at some of the data that he referred to uh, in, in that meeting. Uh, I'm going to have Professor Mark Akison of BME introduce Victor, and we'll have time afterwards for Q&A or <coughs> extend the conversation for those of you who are free to stick around until 3.30. We'll also have coffee and cookies at that time as well. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you uh, especially to the people from the Chancellor's Office who've made it. Um, uh, it's important to have you folks here. Uh, I, I met Victor uh, about three years ago, and it was in the capacity of something called the Bioengineering Institute of California, which is basically a, a, an organization that tries to integrate bioengineering through um, all ten campuses. And uh, it's the, the leadership of that is an amazing group. They view bioengineering as a duty collectively of the UC system, and so the representatives to that organization are the leadership at bioengineering uh, faculties throughout the system. And one of those was Victor Rogers, who um, uh, made an immediate impression on me that first year. And we've been friends since. Um, as you see, he's a Jaeger professor of bioengineering at UC Riverside. He got his PhD from WashU uh, in St. Louis and is a fellow of AAAS. His work is on biotransport phenomena and the osmotic pressure of crowded protein solutions. Um, importantly for this talk today, I, in, 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 in issues of participation and, and underrepresented groups in STEM, is A, um, how well has an organization run by an individual succeeded? So as chair of bioengineering at Riverside, underrepresented students, PH students, went to, from 8% to 25% under Vic, uh, Victor's leadership. And then the other question is, uh, as engineers, put some numbers behind this. And that's one of the things that was particularly attractive about having Victor come today. And that, there you are, Victor. Uh, and I look forward to lots of feedback from this group afterwards. Well, thank you, Mark. <laughs> so thanks for in, uh, inviting me, by the way, Zia. Uh, and I am apologize for blowing you off, essentially, in November. Uh, when, uh, I was actually working on the osmotic pressure proposal, so. But uh, today I wanted to talk about, um, you know, just what's the math associated with inclusion, et cetera. And I, I want to uh, just make, make a correction, uh, Mark. Um, I was, uh, at, it was actually at the University of Iowa, and it was about 10 years ago uh, where I made this ch uh, dramatic change in, uh, in the growth and diversity. So the University of Iowa, you immediately can imagine, it was a pretty white campus. And so when I show you the, the data associated with that, and what I'm ultimately trying to show you is um, I just became a full professor like in 2002, and I, you know, I already knew back when I was uh, decided to become a professor, be, um, I had a science program going on in Pittsburgh, and we had uh, this Pen Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science as it was then, uh, and I was just a BS degree in chemical engineering at the time, and, uh, and I went to, um, the program was 600 students from all over Pennsylvania, and there were two African Americans at the time who were in the science fair competition. And this was like sixth through eighth grade. I'm like, you know, well, damn, how are you going to be a professor <laughs> if you never even showed up at the science fair, right? <laughs> and so let me, I took two over 600, and I took the probability, and it's like an arm or something walking around on every 10 campuses. So, <laughs> so uh, by the way, I have a twin brother, too. He's a theoretical physicist at the uh, University of Iowa still. And um, so he and I both sort of felt like, you know, um, you know, we, we were fortunate enough to uh, get through the system, just go ahead and be a professor. You know, I was actually in industry for a long time as well, and I, I decided to just go back and get my PhD, and you know, I was sort of driven to do research anyway. And so, along the way though, and there's sort of a cost associated with that is, um, is, is sort of your duty to try and move things a little bit more forward. So what I want to talk about though is, uh, 
a mathematical interpretation, and I'm going to talk about it from an engineering perspective, of what I see for uh, gender and ethnic inclusion in the STEM fields. And it won't be, I'm not going to, I don't know how you came up with 3.30, but... Oh, no, so I think you're talking. <laughs> but you think I'm going to talk to 3.30? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... I think you're done talking, and then we have time for oh, okay. 3.30 for a group conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first thing you want to ask, though, is about inclusion, is what really matters. And there was a... And, 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 it, and it comes down to... Uh, you often hear about issues of inclusion. And it's, this is kind of weird, because, you know, I'm thinking about it all my career, I'm having the same conversation. Uh, is, there, there, is there a clear lack of diversity in the STEM fields? You know, there's only, uh, what, 20% African Americans anyway in the United States, 20s, you know, the ones that don't, it's probably 35, but we don't bother filling out the censor form, so it's only about, you know, so the numbers look like there's 20. And then what's the rate of inclusion? You know, in California, in which it really uh, was disheartening when I was, in fact, thinking about coming here as a professor, uh, you did away with affirmative action. And the implication was that that window of time for affirmative action was sufficient to provide the growth level where things were at, right? Actually, I, I firmly believe in affirmative action. I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today if they didn't bother to look at my application. Because I wasn't from Harvard, I went to Washington University, we had a solid background and, um, in, in my education. But people tend to, I mean, even an African-American faculty I knew in chemistry, he was an old guy, about 80, so yeah, man, you know, I got my job because somebody was going to Iowa State and they had an automobile accident and died, so, his advisor says, you want to be a professor? And so it was this good old boy system. He happened to be a black guy, and he became a professor at the University of Iowa in chemistry, and that's how I used to operate. That was the system of, uh, of interplay. So if you weren't in that circle, you weren't moving through the process at all. So the whole idea of affirmative action was merely to look at some applications of strong people and bring it on. It got bastardized for sure. They were bringing anybody they could in to make it look like they tried and then they let it fall apart. But let's go back to, um, I, I digress, and let me go back to some calculations here, okay? So what can academic uh, programs do to improve inclusion? So again, when I was at Iowa, came a full professor and I just said, let me just try to bring in diversity in our PhD program. I'll talk about that later. And, um, and I did that and I created this thing called Ethnic Inclusion Effort for Iowa Engineering. It still exists. Uh, um, of course, I haven't been there for a while, but in the two or three years I was there, we did quite uh, remarkable. Well, let's look at first at what's going on in the engineering professor. And I apologize if you're not in engineering, but I see that's one of the uh, last vestiges of issues with inclusion, that and, in fact, physics, which my brother is in. Okay, so um, you, you can see there's issues there. Uh, only 14% of tenured and tenured track faculty in engineering are women. And that's uh, any number you want to think about. I mean, you, if you're probabilistically bumping into people on a planet and you're doing it easily, you're going to bump into 51% women. And that's just the, dis the distribution of women on the planet. So if you're hitting at 14%, in either there's something going on that in, in somebody's brain or women are being uh, are, are held out of a system. And that's a realistic number. So 14% is ridiculously low for somebody who should be at 51%. 2.7% of the tenured and tenured track faculty in engineering are African American. This is 2012 data. It probably hasn't changed much. And I'll show you why. And Hispanics are 3.9%. Full professors, there's 2.1% that are African American in the entire engineering you know, arena. I think there's countably many engineering faculty in the University of California that are black that are engineering. I mean, I mean there might be two, one hand or two hands of people. You know, there's two on our campus. How many black engineering faculty are on this campus? So that's still two out of the next two campuses. You can, you can move through it. There's not that many of them. Okay, so, and this is a realistic number, even including the historically black uh, colleges and universities, in fact, which have a, a large population of African Americans, and Hispanics, et cetera. And then 0.1% of Native Americans. Native Americans, um, unfortunately, there's not that many of them anyway. It's almost statistically, you know, one or two get a cold, you know, that number's bouncing around, so you'll see that, so. Um, but what the issue is, is you often read in your, you, anything on my diversity or an uh, annual report, you'll read comments like this. Women's enrollment in bioengineering degrees has increased slightly over the past few years from 18.1% in 210 to 18.9 uh, uh, in 212. Black students account for a higher proportion of doctorate degrees than in 2011. This is 2012. 
But where is this going? We all know that, um, so I, you know, I, I, I teach process control. I, do, I did process control at Gulf Oil Company. We looked at transient behavior. Our main thing we were doing, we were trying to uh, perturb a system, a different type of crude came into our distillation tower. We wanted to reach steady state as soon as possible, get it back to where we wanted. We wanted to change the requirements for that, re that, tire, that tower. You don't want to waste no time. You want to maximize the rate, the control system, to get it to where you want to go. So where are we going? And I'm going to talk about this and from a perspective of an uh, um, engineering perspective. Are we achieving an inclusion work, engineering workforce at all? So, so let's look at the pie. This is the distribution of people in the United States, OK? 64% of the country is white. 13% um, is black. So that means if I got, I'm trying to achieve 80% black in my school engineering, it's just wrong, OK? That's not what you want. You want to hit 13%. You know, for, uh, assuming these numbers are correct, this is statistics from 2010. They all move about r relatively slowly. Hispanics, 17. Native Americans, about 1%. And Asians, about 5%. Okay, so this is who makes up the, in the United States. So, as so identifying the inclusion issue, if I took like 100 dots and say the yellow dots all, or the dots all represent a person, um, this is not a demographic, uh, a demographically correct uh, distribution. This is one in a hundred, okay? The appearance of diversity, it can be quite misleading. In fact, this is a demographically correct image. And so what's interesting here is you count, if you count, I hope I got it right, 64 yellow dots for uh, uh, white, whites, um, so many, et cetera. And so uh, this is a Native American or by himself, but still it's the representation of what the demographically correct distribution should appear to be. And so um, I wanted to look at, okay, are we striving to just achieve that? Because we might have already hit it, and we just think that 13% is, uh, is a small number, but it may not be. Let's check and see. By the way, I took some, uh, uh, sense, I looked at the census information. This is old census, but I looked at it again recently. It's the same picture, so I'm not going to recopy this. You know, this is a distribution for counties uh, where the Hispanics are primarily are at percentages in the country. And here's where all the African Americans are in high percentages. Okay, so we're still down here, and you know historically what was happening down here, right? Well, well at least my, my people are showing up in that little pocket. Okay, so we're, we're slightly migrating out, okay? You know, is there Flint, Michigan up here? You know, you know, that's about, you know, little tiny pockets and stuff like that. You know, but that's all we really see, you know, and my, my uncle's from Flint, Michigan, my, my cousin as well. It's a really sad situation. But, um, uh, we're looking at uh, um, what is the metric associated with. So what I want to do is use what was called a representative index, and I apologize, I don't have a reference for it. Actually, I did this with a this distribution here. It's a normalization factor, I call it. And um, but the, but the someone else called it a representative index, so I'll use that language. Uh, what I wanted to say was, if you're if you're a distribution of people in your room with 33% white women then you had a, a representative index, or I, I call omega, was equal to one. So they were demographically correct. So let's think about that number one from the rest of the time we're looking at. That's the normalized value. So if you have 33% white women in your engineering pool across the nation, the nation is demographically correct for white people, white women. If it's 17%, that value would go to one. 17% of your distribution would be correct, and then 13% is African American. So people aren't looking for huge numbers to meet demographic requirements, but they are looking for meeting at least these objectives for these groups. Okay, so so what, what I decided to do was use our characteristic time analysis from an engineering perspective, and that's sort of a first order approximation model uh, where we look at how, how things behave relative to each other. You see there's growth, and then you see things sort of take off and move forward. We're hoping to see uh, two things, that the time constant, how long it takes for something to reach these values of one for these groups, is relatively short. And we're also trying to see whether or not uh, we actually match, meet that value of one for every group that we're looking at. So that's sort of the goal here. So um, by the way, this is a friend of mine. She's uh, Lilia Abram. She's the first African-American woman in the United States to get a PhD in chemical engineering. And uh, what's really cool about her is we have a whole story I could tell you about her. And I just thought I'd drop her on everybody is because uh, 
she's a super role model in my mind. She actually owns her own company called Peer. Peer, and um, one of the things she did with her company, she's been a, she was a professor for a while at Vanderbilt, and then she decided to go start her own company. And one of the things she did, I just want to tell you a short story, is that when she went to South Africa to do some business with environmental work, she said she got off the plane, plane she said you saw those shanty towns, said I gotta do something about this. And so she created what's called Pure Africa, and they created what's called Eco Homes, and now there's 10,000 Eco Homes over 20 years and almost losing their business, but still getting it to come up and work. But they've tra transformed these neighborhoods just by her investment and making in, in a vision to change that. So that's a whole story we could talk about, about her. So she's a good friend of mine. The reason I actually, another side note, you know, I'm an African American faculty member at the University of Iowa, and, um, and I remember uh, talking to a, a, one of the older faculty members, his name was Carl, Carl Kammermeyer, and I always thought this other woman was the first African American uh, female in chemical engineering with her PhD. But he started telling me a story. Yeah, you know, he was in the chemistry building. You know how back in the, you know a few years ago, these dudes be smoking their cigars in the chemistry building, big signs saying <laughs> no smoking. He's like, yeah, you know, there was this black woman named Lilia Abrams. She was a dynamo, and he's smoking a cigar. And I'm thinking we're gonna blow up. I'm only mainly worried about that. But so I went and looked in. In those days, you know, this was in the uh, early '90s. I had to use card readers, look up, and I called her. And I said, um, I was real nervous, and I said, uh, you know, shaking on the phone, uh, uh, Dr. Abram, are, uh, are you the first African-American woman with a PhD in chemical engineering in the country? She said, and I said, because I heard that this other person was. She says, well, I can't say I'm the first woman, but I know damn well she ain't, because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I came out five years before her, right? And so, and so but we, we kind of hit it off after that. She's really cool, but... Yeah, she's in her 70s now, but she's still got her company running and is doing well. Look it up, Pierre, uh, Dr. Abe, and you can read a story about Pure Africa. It's very inspiring, and so um, just wanted to mention her. And so, um, getting back to our mathematics, now we're going to do some math today. Uh, when I identify the inclusion issue, I want to assume first order process. I'm only going to look at uh, a first order, uh, you know, uh, a process where it re eventually reaches a steady state. And I'm going to look at women in BS degrees at first, okay? And then I'm going to normalize that where if you're 51% for this value, then the curve goes to 1. So, and then I'm going to look at the data um, uh, from um, 1990 and project it on. So I was doing this a long time ago. And so I did it for um, chemical engineering, and I did it for all women in BS, and I'll show you in just a second. So here's the mathematical model for everybody. You know, like I'm sure Jordan better recognize this, you know. <laughs> it's the first order of behavior, you know, and... Uh, and all we're looking at is a solution right here. And I wanna, want you to look at this model here. It says this is the value of, for, for women. And I'm gonna do a regression on NSF's data, National Science Foundation's data on women. And, uh, and I wanna look at chemical engineering briefly, but then I'll look at uh, women and, and, and engineering. And this value here, if you look at this as the exponential function, t minus, or t over tau, tau is a time constant. And it says every time constant you reach to, you know, you're, you're, you're moving forward. So it's kind of like you, the biologist may use what's called a, um, what's a half-life. You know, it's a half-life, and after a few uh, half-lives, it's all gone, right? Or all you reach your steady state. So think about this as sort of di dictating that about, if you have a time constant, in about four time constants, you reach a steady state. Could be e to minus four, and that's substantially smaller than one. So that value would go to now. One other parameter that's critical is the steady state value it's going to. So we have two things we have to worry about here: how long it takes for something to go somewhere, and where is it going when it gets there. And so that's what we're looking at every day. So this is something that everybody in the world could have done. I just I got bored with reading these. Like in 2011, it did this. 2012, it did that. I said, what's it doing overall over a period of real time? And so I'm going to skip this Kim E stuff, but let's go back to just look at women in engineering now. BS degrees awarded women in engineering only. So I took all the data from the National Science Foundation, so it was legitimate data. And you know, for 35,000 years, women weren't in engineering at all. And so you could see, <laughs> you could, so, so I ignored the dead time. We call it dead time. I mean, it's another model. I began my model where women began to show some appreciative uh, growth. And then I did a, a characteristic fit for that data. 
So I had this line here because um, around uh, 95, I predicted this curve here. And I said, it's going to go out to here in the in, in system. And so I stopped the data here just to show you this. This is a 1995. So you know you got about five years behind on your data. And what I'm looking at is uh, the prediction was that the growth rate was relatively slow. If you take six multiplied by four, it takes about 24 years for it to reach steady state in this fit. And so you can see it's taking, you know, from 70s up to about something is going to, but we had a nice period here for a, a change. It looked like it was about to, oh, it's going dis to disprove us. And then it's going to take off. But where should this number be? This curve is, for women in engineering, is about 35.35, right? But in fact, the number should be here if you're at 51%. So the horrible conclusion you can draw is that there's two things. This was a period of time when affirmative action was alive and well. You know, things are dying off now. This was the efforts of showing we don't need it anymore. And the other aspect of it is associated. And what's nice about women is you can't argue, well, you know, there's only, you know, there's 51% of them. So it's not like you can't make up oh, a small pool, the conversation we hear all the time. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the reality of it is, is that this number is pretty bad for an engineering uh, analysis of where, where we are, at least in terms of uh, women in engineering. If you do it with some of the sciences, uh, it might be different. Uh, psychology, for instance, and, and biology are, are demographically correct. Um, physics is probably negative numbers or something, you know. But, um, but the other issue is that, so we're only at... 30% growth, and it looked like it's reached steady state. And so I predicted this later uh, last year uh, to see where it was going, and I was kind of impressed with the data for a moment. I thought I was going to do a, a real, another curve fit, take off like that. That's what you would expect to do. Excitement takes place, everyone's in, and all of a sudden it takes off, and then it you know, goes into an exponential uh, increase, not a, a, a decay like this. And so this was unfortunate for women, for, for us, actually. And so... It's not a damn thing engineers do that makes it man de dependent in terms, and especially for faculty. You know, some of them folks can barely turn a screwdriver. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not looking at them as like, what's so aggressively masculine about being an engineer? I don't see it, okay? And, and so there's no reason to justify these types of numbers. And the implication is if we're fair to the world, we should be doing every effort to bring this number back up to one. I mean, everybody should be. And it shouldn't be, it's not a woman's issue, it's people who are in positions like myself who should be doing something about it. I, oh, I yes? The 31%, is, is there disaggregated data as far as the women compositional diversity within those percentage rates? This is all women. Okay. It's 100, all women. So, so and it's 31% of the one, so it's what, 15% like or something? of uh, the actual pool or something like that, yeah. So what I did later was like, we don't, I really care about the PhD. And I remember graduating with a PhD in chemical engineering and he had this whole book on all the minorities that came out and PhDs in chemical engineering was like a handful of them. And I'm like, it wasn't that big a book, it was 1989. But then uh, I wasn't even on it. And it was like in chemical engineering, I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, and it turns out I was one of three or four people in the country who were African-American and got a PhD in chemical engineering in 1989. And so we say five because there's a couple of Africans that got their PhD in 1989. But listen, you know, if you were born in the United States, that number is below that number. So, and so down here, I took the chemical engineers and PhDs in chemical engineering. That was my field before I came to the University of California, Riverside. And I looked at the distribution of the PhD growth and the rate of growth of PhDs graduating in the United States with chemical engineers from uh, during this period of time from 1980 all the way up to 2005. I want to point to you one more thing again and that is that that yellow line at the top that's when you're demographically correct so if and for white women I use them specifically If they hit 33% of white women getting PhDs in the United States, they would be at this point. 
One thing you want to notice in this curve is things that are is that I got a lot, a lot of years here, right? And so you know we always complain about uh, African Americans. We're like we're the little red dots, right? I'm like, man, well, you know, I see all these white girls, you know, got their PhD. Why we, you know? But realistically, their growth rate is the same as ours. So there's nothing fresh about that. In fact, there should be more. There's more uh, white women than there are African Americans. But nevertheless, the growth rate is, is virtually non-existent. So only five African Americans were needed to generate this data point, okay, in, uh, in the entire country. How many people are in this country? I mean, more than six. <laughs> okay. And if you plot this, I don't even have to do a mathematical model for this anymore. I'm going to use a linear extrapolation. And so from a linear extrapolation, it would be 2087 before any of these curves reach demographically correct in the current model we're operating. So when 2087 comes, I promise to come back and give another talk about <laughs> you know, what, what has happened. So, this is, a, this is a, a sad representation of if everybody and their mother has an inclusion program, an effort on their campus, et cetera, and you could pull up data on any of these hard sciences, we'll call them, or STEM sciences, you'll see similar data throughout the country for the students graduating with PhDs, yes. So is the Native, I know you talked about like Native Americans that make up a large of the population, but like in and eight, 1984 was the, where the two black or two the, the two squares reach one up there. Yeah, yeah. Is that just one person? It could be. You know, you know, you know. That's why. That's why. That's a noisy data set, right? And we have to be inclusive with Native Americans, but that's a very small group of people. And this is Native Americans like that are that are Native Americans that are defined by. Congress, right? Like they don't include like Inuits or Hawaiians. Oh yeah, it's not. Uh, it's the NSF uh, definition of Native American. So I think you have to be associated with a tribe, tribe-related uh, uh, Native American. So you know, this is almost percolation theory. Yeah. You know, when you start looking at uh, a person, you know, a Native American, and and I've seen people who say they're Native Americans. My my. my my grandmama was Choctaw. I'm not claiming to be a Native American, but you know, I know some of my cousins they'll be rolling around because they thought there was some money in it. And they're like, oh no, I'm Native. You know, <laughs> no, you ain't. You, you know, you know. But uh, yeah, so people may be making claims, and then if it's legitimate, people allow it. it goes, who knows what that is, right? You know, but this is a rare breed. But you see, they're, they're popping around up and down like that, so it's hard to follow that. But there's very large quantities of, uh, of I, I'd say, uh, white females is the number one true statistical data set that we can look at in this particular case. So, and it sort of represents this is everyone sort of following a similar trend. And so, uh, last year I looked at the um, representative index of academia. Okay, so I'm almost uh, been professor for about what, 20 something years now. I said, well, something's got to have adjusted itself by now, so let me just pull up the data set for uh, a number of women and minorities from the same website, I mean, same, the same uh, piece. And I found that the representative index for academics, for women and minorities. Now, women can include any group, and we bring a lot of international uh, people into the academics and engineering. Uh, so that's another representation. You can see there's some slight growth. Again, this is going to follow a curve that's going to take you into the 20, 21 something, 2100s or so at this current rate for women. African Americans, I think we had our heyday. It's, on, it's over now. So there's no growth in African American faculty in the engineering uh, um, uh, 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 sector, nor really for Hispanic in terms of the rate of uh, what's called the representative index for for that, for academics. So, so I use that mathematical model to show people, stop talking to me about what happened in 2011. Oh, we got a 15% improvement. You know, let's plot the whole thing out and look at where things are going. And it's devastatingly low. And, and again, you can argue the pipeline stuff all you want, but there's very few K through 12 programs that don't have women in them, or girls at least. 
and who can also become faculty in the United States. And, uh, and so I don't find, I don't see what the justification for this is. K through K, uh, 12 programs in, are, are disparate for underrepresented groups. They're very poor people. Uh, and you know our whole system in the United States is based on how much money your mama making. Basically, based on that is what kind of education we're gonna give you, which is kind of weird for a, a first world country. Nevertheless, that's what we got. And so I could see how it could be disparate for African Americans and Hispanic groups, but this women numbers were more telling than that because it tells you that there's something else going on here in, this, in, the, in the record. So, uh, so I, I, what I did was, I'm gonna go back now to me being a professor at, in 2012, and now I'm just, you know, uh, 2002, sorry. Uh, I'm, now I'm, I'm, I'm full professor. That means, like Mark could tell you, you know, I don't have to always come to work no more. So, <laughs> you know, so, so now, nah, you know, I said, no, nah, I saw y'all weren't coming to work. I ain't coming to work either. No, <laughs> no, but more, more importantly, I just said, you know, uh, we don't have free time because all we're doing is the whole idea that the grant programs are, you know, they, they make sure you're scrambling for money all the time. So we're very busy. But I thought that one thing we could do is I could start a program at, at the University of Iowa. You know, it was a very small engineering program, and it sort of was ripe for trying to uh, do something in terms of diversity. And what I was going to do is use that as a platform to show any campus that if the University of Iowa is capable of doing inclusion, you certainly should be able to do it. Okay, and so this is what I thought I want to show here in my next few slides. And so, um, 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 what I wanted to do was in 2003 and five. I was a professor, and I just told the, the, the dean, I'm going to do, uh, uh, I'm going to start a program called Ethnic Inclusion Effort for Iowa Engineering. Actually, I just went to uh, SOCNUS, BMES, uh, uh, NSBE meetings, uh, uh, NSBE, and uh, even, even SWE meetings, trying to recruit people into uh, the, the engineering program. And although I was a chemical engineer, and you know how departments fight all the time, I was recruiting for everybody in the school, because that makes the things a little more palatable. But I was just sort of a, one man show, but then the chair picked it up and it said, Vic, man, you know, you don't be, you know, I was buying these cool bags. My, my, like, you like that? It's cool, cool, simple. It's ancient, it still look good. You know, <laughs> you know, it's ethnic inclusion effort for Iowa engineering, right? They had those on bags at these conferences and you just give them out. And so uh, and I, I was paying my own money for a while there just to just see if it would work. And people were you know, like, first of all, you know, well, black people, they're going to be like, why, why, why Iowa? You know, you know, they gonna drop it on me like that. So I had to do a little more energy for them, right, than for Hispanics or you know other or women or something. But uh, what happened was um, I sort of put this get program together. It had it was relatively inexpensive. In fact, it was didn't cost anything at all because we just brought gang grants. We had some federal support from uh, uh, from other programs that were going on on campus, and um, I tried to create a cultural competency program. And one of the things I was proud of, I, I found the only National Academy member who was really cool with me on campus. You know, if everybody, with faculty, you got to respect the other individual. Otherwise, you go doing something, you know, you're a sister professor, nobody go pay attention to you. Sorry. Sorry, well, you're going to have to just work for it, okay? But, you know, but if you're a National Academy member and you're doing something, everybody's like, oh, yes, I'm. <laughs> and so, as, uh, um, I asked Jerry Schnorr, who was in the environmental, was in the National Academy. I said, I want you to start this program called Faculty, uh, uh, Faculty Fostering Inclusion, FFI. And he says, well, anything for you, Victor. He said, but shouldn't you also make a staff? I said, yeah, that's a good idea. So we called it Faculty and Staff Fostering Inclusion. It was just a matter of faculty and staff who were interested coming together and talk about how they're improving inclusion. But you got also the whole element of rest of engineering. engineering is very arrogant, you know, in our, our, our field, we, we think we know it all. We think if we're, if them, anybody in my research group, they're the baddest students on campus, and you ain't in my group, well, hey, I don't even have to talk to you. You know, so I don't feel like that, I'll, I'll still speak. But that's how faculty roll. And so because of that, you know, and he was running this program in the National Academy, it, it delivered a tremendous amount of respect. And so that was one of the elements we started. We had increased the minority doctorates. We had corporate interest now, and we had some, we were all, me and my brother always did outreach, so we were always doing outreach. And there was lots of pockets of African Americans, Hispanic students in uh, Iowa uh, that we, we would go to and help, as well as uh, 
uh, non-diverse uh, uh, groups as well. And so we do, sort of just put this together. And this is what I'm saying in the two, three, in the three years that I was doing this, and I think the last year I got paid like, you know, a little bit of money, but I left, so I didn't care. But nevertheless, I, we, were, we were in a low, low, um, low cost. I showed that just by me going out and doing recruiting, we went from, this is the departments in biomedical engineering, uh, chem, chemical and bio, bio, biomedical, bio, uh, biochemical engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, mechanical engineering at that time. Uh, this is the total number of students, percentage of U.S. There were women, number of women, number of minorities, et cetera, okay. So we raised the numbers from, this is what Mark was sharing with you, uh, the number of U.S. that are minorities, and these are legitimate minorities too, not, you know, from four to 22 in a three-year period. With, with, all I had was a half-time secretary and, and me taking some time to go talk to people. Plus we had grant support with our other colleagues on campus. We had stuff like, we had, I had a GAN grant and we had some uh, other support. So um, we had um, AGAP money. You guys are probably familiar with AGAP, NSF AGAP money. The number of uh, women also increased because a lot of the minority students were women. And so that was pretty cool. So we actually took, uh, and then I'm only looking at the demographics uh, in terms of percentages for the American students we're bringing in, because there's a large percentage of, um, of uh, um, uh, international students. So there's a total that are U.S. is 35 percent, uh, total of U.S. that are women, total number of women, percent number of total U.S. students are coming in. So the number of U.S. students that were in the program at Iowa in 2002 was 46, but it went to the U.S. students went to 68 in a couple of years, okay, just because, you know, the pocket of diversity is right here. And so um, here's my representative index from 2002 to when I left in 2005, and, and that is we started here, and in just uh, uh, three years, we were able to bring the number of underrepresented minorities in the PhD program uh, up to demographically correct at the University of Iowa. Okay, and that was only, that, was a, that requires like about a 25% pool of PhD students. And those are the American PhD students, okay, so in that pool, okay. And then the number of women still had not quite made it, but um, it was almost uh, 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 there was a pretty high number. And so we were able to achieve in our pool of underrepresented minorities, primarily women. Here's the students I recruited. I don't know where they're at now. Some of our, some of our professors, uh, many of them are on my Facebook. She was my postdoc now. She's a postdoc. She's got her PhD. A few of them got master's students, but the majority of them got their PhD and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and moved to the program. And this was at uh, Iowa. But uh, bottom line was that if we're really interested in inclusion and diversity, it takes more than just throwing money at it. Uh, it takes a little bit of, um, um, you know, it's just some commitment, and you feel it when it happens, you know, but the commitment has to be from the whole. And sometimes you have to be clever about it. I grabbed a National Academy member and had him, you know, do all the respect stuff, because once you get somebody like that, you know, all the faculty sort of follow, you know, in that, in that state of mind. So in Riverside, we're pretty, we're gender balanced in the PhD program in bioengineering. This is what Mark was mentioning. Um, we are at 68% domestic PhD students uh, and 24% are, are underrepresented minorities. So we were at a demographically correct anyway, but Riverside is a little, almost cheating a little bit because, uh, you know, it's uh, a pretty diverse um, uh, undergraduate pool anyway. So people feel really comfortable coming to University of California Riverside. But you mentioned the word Iowa, you know, you can imagine people like, you know, People for Katrina, did, Katrina didn't want to go to Iowa, you know. <laughs> you know I, I think I'll stay here, you know. <laughs> you know so so uh, it was a little bit more, um, more work. So and this is just a picture I remember having of one of my undergraduate groups working on a project. Uh, this guy went to USC now. She's got her PhD. I don't know where he's at, but this is, this is an old picture. But um, <clears throat> these are... Uh, uh, this is just a group of what a, a classroom uh, setting in Iowa sort of looks like. I mean, at Riverside. So, but the bottom line for inclusion, let's just be realistic about it, is that inclusion is achievable. And if I can do it with uh, um, twenty thousand, uh, actually, I told the uh, the dean, you got to pay my pay for one of my grad students. I'll do this, and then so he paid uh, my. So what's that? Twenty fifty thousand. What do grad students cost now? $100,000? Yeah, grad students think they're cheap, but they're not. But 
you know, but um, so he paid one of my students for a, a year, and then um, uh, leader must, however, remain vigilant, okay? And we could pre pretty much get born, uh, bog bogged down with uh, looking at numbers the year before the last year, kind of stuff. We really need to be mapping out uh, from an engineering perspective what's going on. If you're looking at, if you're, I was looking at this data from back when I was at Gulf Oil Company, if we're, if we're operating like this or even uh, like this and, uh, and trying to achieve this value for crude oil production, man, that place that would have been empty. You know, that, that company had been over in, in terms of what you were doing. We're not, not treating it like it's a priority when these numbers, this whole country is not treating this like a priority when that kind of stuff is going on. And this is the BS degree. So you got to get through this little hurdle here to go to the PhD. And so you're not going to be like, oh, man, I'm really smart, so I'm going to go get me a PhD right away. You're not going to skip that BS degree. So this is the pool for the PhD right here. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. Um, uh, I didn't uh, hope you don't think that I'm, we're, we're doing phenomenal stuff at Riverside. We're just very lucky because everybody, people of color from the UC system, uh, show up in, in Riverside anyway. So. Um, but it does, uh, it does help out. Um, but the sustained inclusion system uh, could require decades of work. And so the perception that affirmative action need to be curtailed because he had reached uh, uh, um, uh, a point of, of significance is really a misnomer. In fact, I had a meeting yesterday with our you know, uh, student uh, vice chancellor, student affairs, et cetera, and they were talking about he needed a, a person, of, a, a faculty member, to do a, speak, a talk for a person of color in the STEM fields. And he said, well, there's, there's John and Victor, you guys said, I'm not gonna be doing it. And then blah, blah, blah. I said, you know what's nice about, you should notice, hear what you're saying. I said, you just named every person of color, chemistry, physics, and engineering in one sentence. You just dropped all five names. I said, can you do that for your Asian faculty? God help you if you are, you know, you probably can do it for the white faculty in engineering, but you can't you do it for the Asian faculty or the international faculty. You can't. You know, we're naming, I, I remember telling them at Gulf Oil Company, it, you've reached a level of inclusion when I can't name every black person on this in, 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 at, the univer, at the Gulf Oil Company research facility. So right now I can name everybody, every one of them. So we're getting to a point where we get past the naming, be able to understand there's five, okay, well, she can't do it because they know, they know all their business too. Oh, she's going to be at another meeting because they got, us, got them all spread out doing stuff. So we got to get past that, and that's where leadership comes in. And leadership is, is at the chancellor uh, provost level. It needs to be seriously considered in, in their inner process. So that's all I have. To entertain questions from people in the audience, and, and afterwards we'll be a break, and people need to move on, we can still continue on for another half round. But any questions? Angela, go ahead. Um, if the show for Iowa in terms of PhD, um, was that admission or uh, graduate? Those are the ones that I, we, we, we brought into the PhD students. Yeah, I, I was when they graduated. Um, they graduated. So what, what I was looking at is the pool of students. In fact, They're, so yeah, that was not the. Uh, um, it was a PhD enrollment. So have you looked at sort of I guess decay rates in terms of retention and how have you quantified that? Because I think that's also another. For our Iowa students. Or or Iowa or any. Um, only anecdotally, and and there. You know, about 50% in the United States of uh, st uh, students who start a PhD program finish it. So that's the anecdotal, uh, um, that's the actual number, uh, r roughly. Uh, when I go through the head count, we're better than that with th those pools of students there. But, uh, you know, Iowa has this program still going on, and I really can't speak about, I can't really find the data anymore. I'm curious, right? But I really can't find it on where it is in terms of uh, diversity and that kind of stuff. But I, I think it's still uh, reasonable, you know. So, yeah, you have a good point. I think that, uh, and you know, another thing is I don't have any, you know, st students all over the world complain to me when things aren't going right. You know, I'm, my, 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 uh, 
LinkedIn blows up. Oh, Dr. Ray, you know, my professor's treating me, you know, I'm like, who are you anyway? You know, you're in, you're in Alberta, you know, no, but you know, you know, so, um, but you know, I don't really have any complaints for those students. So I, I got a sense that people were, felt good and treated. I think they, 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 they did a good job with that, yeah. Yes? What do you think about strategies of increasing the faculty? as role models because we're doing pretty bad there. I mean, I think you showed a nice framework for increasing participation in the PhD program or for students, but then <coughs> a lot of times it doesn't go further. Like for women in quite a few disciplines, we've reached really nice representation in the PhD programs, but then it gets stuck there forever. <laughs> So my position on um, on hiring people of color and women in faculty positions is that it is it's a must. And I'll tell you that uh, I've been around in faculty for a long time, and you'll typically hear, "Oh, we're only going to hire the best candidate, et cetera, et cetera." And usually that best is a Russian or somebody from the same school in, in uh, uh, Taejong University or something like that, right? And these best, best, best stuff. But I, I work alongside of people all the time. I swear I don't see all this best stuff. So it's time we start getting past all this uh, level of um, artificial uh, um, metrics and hire people who, who perform well and look like they can do build a sustainable engineering uh, program and hire them at, at, on, on the faculty in, in schools. Because you wouldn't have had ethnic inclusion if I hadn't been there at the University of Iowa. And so um, that brought in those number of students that uh, came as a result of somebody caring about it. And so the reality of it is you gotta hire faculty. But hiring faculty really takes uh, a, a strong chancellors and, cha and strong provost. It's not, it's not a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's gotta be at the leadership level. You don't, cause um, if you have staff members asking for improvement, Faculty are, like I said, there's a whole arrogance window. They're not even going to listen to you. If you had a National Academy member saying you need to hire, that'd be even better. You know, so you got to think about it along those lines. People have to be uh, respected by the faculty to allow that to happen. So that's what I think. Is that what you're asking me? So you're you're saying that your answer is the mechanism is to have a top-down strategy of specifically. I, I think if you see candidates uh, who are. I, I've never seen more energy went into evaluating candidates as I do as when they're an underrepresented minority or a woman. You could see people float in from all kinds of places who are guys from uh, international where we don't even know, I mean, half the stuff I don't even know, you know, just doesn't make sense. But you look at a woman, they're tearing into their paper. I remember my brother brought in a, 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 at the University of Iowa had a, uh, you guys probably know Jim Gates, you know him, right? You know, he's on like the TurboTax commercial, you know, oh. the black dude, the genius they bring in, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's a theoretical physicist too. He's one of the, he's one of the two African Americans that I know that are theoretical physicists. The other one's my brother. And so um, I remember he was gonna come to University of Iowa. He had like over a hundred and something papers, you know, theoretical physics, very solid. And uh, they commenced to, oh yeah, but you know, this, you know, but you know, and they start looking at him, people don't even know what he's working on. You know, I'll tell you another story. This is how bad academia is. Since my brother's a theoretical physicist, he's like he's in the, right in the pool of it all, right? I'm in engineering, so we're a little cooler. And so, so the guy across the hall from my brother, you know, he's going up for tenure. This is back in like 95 or whatever, 96. Came over, you know, a guy from India. And said, so, by, by the way, I want to let you know that, uh, um, um, you know, African Americans and, and, uh, and, and women tend to come in here without postdocs, and I'm going to be uh, um, uh, ruthless with your application for tenure because, you know, you don't have the background and this kind of stuff. It's a guy down the hall from him. He started looking at his package. So my brother let him talk for a while, you know, ramble this stuff. And then he said, you know, it's people like you who don't belong in academia because uh, you don't even bother to read the first paragraph before you make a decision on something. Now, if you had looked at the top three lines on my CV, you would not seen one but two postdocs. 
One was University of Florida, where Pierre Ramon, who does string theory and invented string theory, that stuff that, uh, what's his name, um, Big Bang Theory talks about? No, that was uh, Pierre Ramon. The other one was just, uh, uh, it, it's SUNY, uh, um, uh, SUNY, um, uh, um, uh, um, is it Long Beach, was it, the island they do, the SUNY school? Stony Brook. He was at SUNY Stony Brook and he worked with uh, a Nobel laureate. So, so you're making decisions without even being able to read the first two lines of something. He says, but I'm going to do you a favor. because I'm going to give you one of my papers. I'm going to give you a week to read it. And then you come back and tell me what, you, what you've learned. He gave it to him. The guy came back and said, I'm sorry, I can't even read this. So the reality of it is decisions are being made. This guy was, had the, the kahunas to go tell him how bad his CV was without ever even looking at it and going to tell him how he was going to attack him. So young people you need to understand that you still need to be 110% on your game. Don't be getting relaxed when you see me here. You know, but the reality of it is, is that this kind of attitude permeates throughout academia. The perception that they already understand how bad something is. I've seen it evaluated a hundred times. I, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm a professor. I, you know, I'm sitting in the room, I'm trying to, I'm countering this stuff all the time. I'm dealing with it. So the reality is we need to get past all this stuff, the rambling, and start looking at people, people of color and women, and start hiring in academia and engineering.